Hey everybody, I'm Sean Robinson and visiting us today, we have a special guest coming straight from the desert to you, Ms. Linnea Sturta. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So you, you are in San Diego uh, today and uh, we're recording this on Friday. And if I'm not mistaken, tonight is the actual Eisner uh, Award Ceremony. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Oh my God. Um, that's happening. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm mostly, I'm mostly gonna go because uh, Patrick, my publisher, he's so enthusiastic about this right now. And I'm terrified of award ceremonies. I mean, I haven't been to that many, but even the one in Angoulême, my publisher told me in advance we were gonna win. I think it's a means to convince me to go there. Uh, and I still I still felt like weirdly nervous about it in some way I can't quite describe. But yeah. Um so your your nomination tonight is for uh last year's the the fall uh the sorry, the a frog, frog in the fall. In the fall a frog in the yeah. fall. And, yeah. and but the the Anglo M nomination was that for uh stages of rot, your previous uh, it was also for Frog in the Fall. Okay. Uh, and, for the French edition. And uh, I, I, the, the, we have a brief time here, I'm just going to go ahead and say, because obviously we're cutting into your signing time, your cloud gazing time, your uh, Oh, my, my looking at shrubs time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> euphorbia smuggling time. Don't tell anyone yeah. smuggling euphorbias across the border. Um, uh, so, so, but, but specifically, the thing I, 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 I looked at this long list of questions I had made for you, and basically, the thing that boiled down uh, the, to it, if I could boil it down to the two questions, is how did you get so good so early? Uh, it, it, number oh, I'm two, like thirty-one. Well, it, but uh, stages are right. I mean, you, you completed that in two thousand seventeen, right? Oh yeah, I did. I did. So I mean, that, I, I mean, started in twenty sixteen, and then yeah. I'm an old guy now, so to me, uh, somebody making a uh, you know debut graphic novel at 25 that's stunning, and then making a stunning follow up, you know, four years later that's a completely different genre and has a totally different tone and you know reason for existence and everything. It just seems like you know you've you've got a wide range of possibilities, uh, you know, for. <laughs> You know mm. what, what's going to happen next just just you, you've kind of staked out two separate you know two separate locations on the on the landscape neither of which are particularly covered with other things so i mean what how many pages what have you made in privacy before this first graphic novel and the second graphic novel uh actually before the first one not much uh, mm. i used to when i went to school i used to like doodle little comics in like sketchbooks and stuff and then when i got older i thought i would get into animation because it seemed more like viable as a career uh so i went to cal arts for a couple of years uh that was like in like uh, 2014 15 uh and the beginning of 16 i think um so i did uh I think the thing that like really was my breakthrough when it came to visual storytelling was like yeah, doing storyboards. Mm. Um, I had the my Crianda from the Mitchells versus the Machines movie, Gravity Falls. That guy mm. was my storyboard teacher. And I think the storyboard class, storyboarding in general helped and also like doing little animations. I think uh, learning animation, you get this thing with like, you know, you do all the little poses and the characters from all these angles. And I think comics, so much of it is like selecting exactly which one of those moments is like the proper moment, you know, to convey instead of drawing them all. So it's obviously very different, but it gives you some kind of entry point, I think, into just like telling stories with pictures. Right. So I wasn't much of a comics person and I had a Tumblr blog at the time and that's like where Piao Pao Comics found me and were like, just make a book for us. Uh, I think because they're, they're a Swedish publisher, but they mostly publish in English and they mostly work with uh, like non-Swedish, I think mostly French and American artists. Um, so it was kind of like, I think they were happy to find someone Swedish who drew in a very non-Swedish way <laughs> like they're very into French comics and I'm very into like French comics but not not like in a geeky way 
because I'm, I'm terrible at being a nerd, but uh, I mean, I love the art. So, uh, so they were the ones who like asked me to do a graphic novel just based on the on my blog. And then very naively, I agreed to do that. <laughs> and that was like the end of my animation career. No, but um, so I kind of dropped out during 2016. I was working on that and then Trump won and I felt like, oh my God, everyone at CalArts is going to be so annoying about this. I mean, <laughs> righteously so, because like, obviously you guys have a right to be pissed off. And I'm sitting here like this person who is kind of exempt from what's happening in America, even though I, I kind of like it here. <laughs> but um, So I actually, I think doing one graphic novel it kind of became a shortcut to doing like visual development stuff in animation and all that so I feel like it's been kind of these parallel things where I've been doing a bit of like freelance animation work and a bit of comics work and I guess the freelance animation stuff would be like the stuff you don't directly see sure. I guess mm -hmm. like the parts of whatever my artistic development that are kind of hidden because I mean it's sort of a thing you have to seek out more than the graphic novels have like finished products in themselves. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it's very interesting that, uh, you know, you're, you're identifying that, uh, you know, one that they, uh, they're saying, Oh, there's this something about this style that I want to work with. You're, you're saying French, but to me, like, I, I have a kind of like private, like this is the international style or a international style where, <laughs> you know, you obviously are extremely like visually educated by all of these different, uh, you know, developments over several decades. Um, and it mm. doesn't, doesn't seem like there's a ton of people really, plugged into that kind of, you know, you, you see people who who take a take a style and kind of wear it like a coat, you know, and then you, you put it back off when the season has changed. And it's not quite mm. the same as sort of steeping in all of these things. So I mean, what what's your visual background that you've kind of come to this particular, you know, oh, style? I think it was like growing up as I mean, I used to read a lot more comics than I do now, like when I was a teenager, I was super into it I'm trying to get back into actually reading more stuff but when I was younger it was like I've grown up in like very small towns across Sweden basically and none of them had like a proper comic book store and the thing you'd find at like libraries at the gas station or something would be like a lot of French albums like just the most mainstream stuff like Tintin and Asterix mm -hmm. and all that um and then obviously there were like Swedish some Swedish stuff I read as a kid and like then manga started being translated and like the first the earliest stuff that got translated to Swedish I think like on a, on a bigger scale was like just Dragon Ball and One Piece like shonen stuff basically <laughs> so and also you have this thing with like superheroes used to be more of a thing over there but they're not really anymore so you can kind of find old like Bronze Age Silver Age kind of that era of comic books and they then they kind of petered out at the end of the 90s sort of uh, in terms of like diversity in superhero translation yeah. <laughs> translations into Swedish so it was this kind of thing where I was like just reading whatever I got my hands on basically it's kind of like I went through phases of like trying to draw manga or trying to draw this or that and like I think maybe I ended up with something like kind of eclectic just because like I was so limited in what I was able to find I couldn't dig myself too deep into one thing uh, like later in my teens when I started like being able to like go places myself like going to Stockholm or whatever they had more like comic book stores there so I read more like English manga like I think that was around like the Tokyo pop era of manga, yeah. basically when they had like a lot of it coming out and kind of cheaply. And I think, I think around my late teens was when I was like getting my hands on more like, how, how do I say, not like indie, but like the more prestige stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. Morbius and Taiyo Matsumoto and that kind of stuff. Okay, so I have Which a list of four became people. like my idea of what a fancy good comic looks like. You know? Right. That, that is, is, I, I, I'm very gratified that you said Teo Masamoto because I, my list says uh, Miyazaki, Teo Masamoto, Alex Deacon, and Elsa Besco. Uh, so, oh, uh, oh. oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. 
it's like three of them that I know who they are. So, <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you, uh, Alexis Deacon is a is is a contemporary uh, of yours. So he's oh, got, okay. What well, what's what's he doing? Uh, he, I would he, feel like vaguely embarrassed when I know <laughs> know about people that I, feel I should know about. No, Alexis. I, I, I think he probably just has very similar uh, influences to you. Um, not necessarily that you oh. would have been influenced by him. Um, oh yeah, I'm Curse seeing stuff chosen. here. Oh, this is adorable. Yeah, he's doing Cur that kind of children's book illustration stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he also yeah, did okay. a graphic novel series called uh, Curse of the Chosen. Um, that uh, you know, the, the the thing that's a commonality to me is is the sort of like uh, you know meta mythic framework, like status of mm. rot. You know, uh, you're you're not pinning down. This is not a metaphor for a particular thing. You're instead. I mean, if I can. I'm not trying to speak for you. Oh, yeah, sure, uh, sure. In, in my estimation, you know, you're you're presenting a complex situation and allowing people to have their own kind of uh, reaction to a meta mythic mm. setup. You've created something yeah. that's so potent that this can kind of explode out in different ways. I, mm. you know, it, it, the the Miyazaki, like uh, you know, Nausicaa or something like that, has that sort oh, of I love po manga. potency to it. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's like Alexis is drawing from some of those same mm. kinds of things. So not necessarily, I wasn't trying to say he's an influence on you. But no, just, no, that's, no. That's just the like, sphere. I feel like I should know more, you know, about <laughs> the, the current landscape in general, because there's so much happening. And I'm, mm. I feel like I'm living as this hermit, just working all the time <laughs> and like occasionally trying to like find inspiration from stuff. But like you end up, I don't know. It's like when you go into like other media with the intent of finding inspiration, you become like this very mercenary kind of person who's like, I guess I'm trying to like find enjoyment and stuff again. And right. like someday I'm going to succeed. I'm reading more books now, like novels. Yeah. I feel like it's it's so hard to like actually rip off a novel as a comics artist because <laughs> it's such different mediums. <laughs> like it's this entirely non-visual medium. Right. So whatever I'm like visualizing in my head, I can kind of like, okay, that's mine because it's just like, right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it, the, it, when it, whenever I go through periods of uh, like really like uh, intense songwriting, I don't want to listen to music at all. Cause you're exactly right. Oh, you're yeah. Gonna yeah. You're going to take too directly yeah. from the thing, you know, accidentally or whatever. And instead, yeah, you want to seep in something that's totally, totally different. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it it seems to me that like that your your uh, Patreon comic that you're working on right now, Garden of Spheres, kind of maybe belongs a little bit more with stages of rot in terms of, uh, you know, the type of things that you're drawing from. Uh, whereas like the, the thing that made me think about El Sabesco is uh, specifically Frog in the Fall um oh know, yeah uh like even though it's set in japan or it seems to be anyway um you know in terms fantasy of fantasy from japan everyone is a little talking amphibian which obviously doesn't <laughs> exist in japan in real life it would be cool if it did. i'm really disappointed <laughs> to hear that Are you telling me that uh yeah um but but at the same time like the, there's something so I, I should just say like uh maybe this is a tradition that i'm not aware of but um el sabesco is the person that i am aware of who you know all my, many of her books she's a she was a swedish illustrator um it was a really incredible you know line art incredible color um but mm, also yeah. you know the scale of everything she's shrunken everything down so all of her world takes place in this kind of smaller scale thing uh, there's a similar kind of you know aspect to some of the frog in the fall stuff just by the nature of yeah. the scenario i think it's like a weird nostalgia thing about like imagining tiny little critters and magical people and whatnot like just going around in the woods like i don't know like being a kid that's kind of a thing i would do like find like mossy rocks and kind of imagining what I think probably due to like the kinds of children's books I was exposed to back then, mm. like it was very easy for my imagination to like just fill in like little natural landscapes, like just the roots of a tree or something with oh someone could live there, you know. So I think I think actually both stages of rot and frog in the fall it goes back very much to like childhood impulses. Yeah. <laughs> In a way, it's like I used to watch a lot of nature documentaries when I was homesick or whatever. Like you know, walking with dinosaurs, the one with like the CGI dinosaurs that was kind of like a fake nature documentary about like the lives of dinosaurs and like it was usually very tragic they usually like died horribly because obviously they're gonna die and be fossilized um 
and that kind of stuff. So it was like that when I was first asked to draw a graphic novel, I tried to like think up like a complicated real story or something, and then that didn't work out. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take like some kind of natural process and just do like a fake nature documentary about it, basically. And then obviously it turned into more of a like weird, dreamy, Voynich manuscript thing that's like, I think trying to like let people fill in the gaps a little bit, like give people enough meat so they can like have something to to interpret, but also like leaving a lot open. And then the frog book was like this other, because after, after stages of art, I kind of tried to do more in the same style and I got very stuck mm. for a while and it just didn't work out. Like I tried a bunch of different things that I worked on for like two years or something and nothing really came of it. And I became really frustrated. So that's kind of when I decided to do the frog thing that was just totally different, like aesthetically totally different mm -hmm. than narratively. I wanted it to feel like complete, you know, like a Pixar movie that's like right. not too many loose threads. And in the, in the end, there are loose threads because I can't write something that's just like a perfect machine. You know, I'm not I'm not that good um, at that kind of writing. It also goes back to this like weird child impulse of like imagining little bug people and things. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess a, that's what's easy to work with. Oh, sorry. I, oh, I, I just wonder how much I, you know, I, I have a, I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old now and, uh, you know, I get to see oh, them, wow. they, they play and everything. And it, it, it's occurred to me more than one time that like uh, the, 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 I think we carry this impulse, you know, through to adulthood, but there's something yeah, about yeah, being definitely. at the wrong scale of everything that might kind of, you know, they're closer to the ground. They can see down the things they feel like the bugs mm. of their friends, you know, but it's also like they're, they're, closer in size to that and they're further away in size to the adults you know i'm not sure if that are actually... i think there's something very appealing with like either things that are extremely tiny or things that are extremely large it's like uh, you know nihei the japanese artist who did blame and biomega oh, sure. and yeah knights of sidonia and a bunch of stuff the way he renders these landscapes that are like impossibly big and people are kind of just disappearing into these like impossible industrial or architectural landscapes. I think there's something very appealing to that, which is kind of the same visceral appeal that you have with little bug people just yeah. going about the world, you know. It's very strange, but I, I think I tried to have some of that in Xavier's of Rot, where it was like people just dwarfed in these impossibly huge environments. Right. And then the frog, obviously, he's just a tiny little guy, so he's going to be small compared to, like, regular garden weeds and blades of grass and whatnot, because he's, like, just a little right. frog. Or um, the dog. Or, uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if the frog is ever gendered in the comic. I don't think they are, but right. I don't know. <laughs> it's small. It's a small frog. So. <laughs> what, so you're in this position now where you've had two things that are you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're making a good case for the commonalities between them, but, um, you know, may, maybe on first blush are different from each other. Um, so, you know, are, do you, do you feel any particular impulse to do more of one of those types of things and kind of push more in one particular direction? Or do you think that this is a, a, a case of, you know, seeing what's interesting and, and kind of just pushing towards whatever it is that's um. I feel like I'm gonna try and like keep trying out new things like I want to do more like little animal froggy things because it's fun you know when people really respond to it right. uh, but I, I also feel like I don't know I, I have this like goal of making my masterpiece or whatever when I'm like 40 or 60 or something mm -hmm. so I feel like I'm, I'm still in that phase of my life where I can like keep trying out stuff and not like tie myself down to like one style or one theme or whatever um, I feel like I'm kind of still stuck in the nature theme and in like this exploration of like since the frog comic I'm still like doing stuff that feels very centered around this like leaving home and like mm. adventure versus comfort and all that when I did stages of rot I obviously wasn't thinking about ever doing like a cutesy frog comic and that just came later so it feels very hard to like predict what I'm going to be drawn towards in like five or 10 years or something, you know, sure. it's like, I try to be flexible and I mean, obviously the internet doesn't like you to like do 50 different things at the same time. 
I think like my my viability like algorithmically has been really hurt by like having three different audiences and like these people are here for my flower sketches and these people are here for frogs and these people are here for like European style fantasy sci-fi comics. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, I feel like there's more to do with that kind of flexibility, which I really enjoy. So, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I answered your question. No, it's per scrambling. perfectly. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I feel like you're 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 telling me exactly exactly what it is. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the the other thing that's really remarkable besides just the actual experience of the story and your storytelling, reading your books is uh, is how diverse. You know, even things like your mark making, uh, and uh, you know, you have you seem to have characteristic marks and such. But I mean, you know, you, you've so wildly varied the techniques. Uh, from book to book so far that it doesn't feel like there's a characteristic visual style, not forgetting even this about the subject matter, you know? Um, so like with, with stages of rut, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's all pencil and then you've selected how to colorize the pencil per chapter. Uh, is that? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, the pages were like graphite, the, the lines were graphite and then the colors were Photoshop, I think. I tried to do like a limited color scheme for each chapter. I think at some point there was like an idea of reso printing it, but then I didn't really know how reso printing worked because right. I was an animation person. So, but the, it ended up being very convenient to have like one color scheme per chapter yeah. just to like set a mood and like have something to work with. Um, and then the frog obviously is just the black and white, except it's blue and white. Um, and and you're you were creating that with is is it pen and ink plus a like a digital noise tone is that yeah it's uh, pen and ink and then uh, a digital texture that's just like Photoshop add noise black yeah. and white sort right. of to get the contrast uh, and then also these textures I did like for patterns on clothing and everything I had those saved as separate little Photoshop files so I could just like copy paste them into. Uh, into whatever surface they were meant to color, cover. I think at the time I was doing the frog book, I thought of it a lot as like a kind of limited animation almost. Yeah. Like if you look too closely at the frog book, which maybe you shouldn't because it's gonna ruin the magic <laughs> if you experience some kind of magic from that book. But um, there's a lot of like reuse of the same background yeah. or like a character where like only the eyes or hand shifts between two pages or something. Right. Because I was trying to churn this out and like I, I had this idea and I was working like frenetically on it and I was taking a lot of shortcuts. So there's a lot of like, I, I mean, I have like inked pages where it's like the background, a character in one post and then the next little post down in the corner or something. So it's, there's a lot of sheeting in the frog book is mm -hmm. what I want to say, <laughs> but maybe I was just being practical. I don't know. I, I mean, if, if it was an animation, I mean, you wouldn't paint the background over and over again, unless you were. Yeah, exactly. Animation. Exactly. That's how I justified it in my head. I mean, it's oh, not yeah. animation, but it's, I was trying to think of it like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's incredibly effective, uh, especially mm. given the format. That oh, yeah, I, I know there's, I know there's a lot of manga that also reuses backgrounds because like, it's kind of rude to make your assistant draw like the same background five times or something right. <laughs> yeah and and there's a certain kind of like uh it feels like a stationary quality to the eye you know where you you can you take in the new information in a different way because you you backgrounding the old information like you're yeah you yeah know, the staticness uh pushes it back a little bit after yeah the little the details closing. that change become a lot more significant when right. the rest of the pure static yeah yeah um, well, uh, I, I don't want to keep you uh, very much, you know, very much longer here, but uh, we, uh, because of your, your uh, other engagements yeah. that you're making you late for. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mine and Dershing's talks about growing Dershing's in the car, like kind of ate up the interview time. But these are very important plants. These are very important plants. Uh, um, what, so you have a you have a show going on um, concurrent with uh, with uh San Diego Comic Con. So will you tell? Yeah, at Gallery Nucleus that? in Los Angeles. Yeah, and so it's the originals from the Frog comic, mostly um, mostly graphite sketches. From um, I mean, I did the sketches in graphite and then traced on a light table for the inked pages. Okay. So the the pieces they selected were a lot of the sketches, 
and like some some ink drawings and some uh, some from Blood Codex, the comic I did uh, along with Stadius of Rot. So it's like a bunch of selected little pieces of uh, his original art that's on exhibit. And I think a bunch of them are sold and a bunch of them aren't sold, but they're all there for another 10 days or so, I think. Excellent. Yeah. Well, um, very much looking forward to it. And uh, thanks for for talking with us and good luck tonight. Uh, people who are watching this will already know how it how it happened. Uh, but, oh, my uh... God. <laughs> oh, my God, are you sending this live? No, 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 no. People are seeing my little potato face. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing is live. Uh, nothing is live here. Okay, no. good. good. Um, yeah, so people people Sorry. watching this will already know the outcome. You guys are the futurists. You guys have the, uh, you know, you guys have the uh, the, the insight. Um, but, but um, you know, I, I really appreciate you talking with us. I, uh, I can't wait to see what you do next. And I'm hoping that you'll come back and uh, talk to both of us uh, next time when you have uh, something else to talk uh, that you'd like to share. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks so thanks. much. Yeah, bye. All right. Make sure to like, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell.